Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third quarter Market Insight webinar. Consistent with past webinars, the goal here is twofold. Number one, explain what has happened over the previous quarter. Number two, provide all of you, our listeners and clients, some things to watch for across the markets and economy as we move into the fourth quarter in 2023. As a way of introduction, my name is Greg Leenberger. I'm the director of research here, but before going on to further introductions with the team, a couple of housekeeping items, the usual reminders. First of all, we welcome all questions. We want to address what is on your mind. If you do have a question, we will take them, take them at the end. Please use the chat function, I'm sorry, the Q&A function on the screen to submit questions. And then this webinar, along with previous webinars, are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you would like to rewatch this webinar or past webinars, please go to our YouTube channel and find those. Now for introductions. I already introduced myself, but I'm joined by seven other members of our research team. Jessica Naviscus will talk about the U.S. economy. James Torgerson will discuss fixed income. Catherine Hillier will review U.S. equities, and Evan Frazier will review non-U.S. equities. Chad Schaefer will take us through hedge funds. Josh Cabrera will cover real assets consisting of real estate and infrastructure. And Brett Graffy will wrap up the discussion talking about both private equity and private credit. So with introductions out of the way, we'd like to start with the U.S. economy because that is the natural backdrop to all capital markets. Jessica, consistent with past quarters, we've seen a lot happen. We've seen more rate increases. We've seen more bad news on inflation as well as other macroeconomic news. So take us through what you're seeing and what you're watching for for the rest of the year. So we're still in a largely macro driven market and the macro story really starts with inflation. Everyone is aware whether you follow markets or just consume anything that inflation has accelerated really quickly this year. Levels we haven't seen since the 70s and 80s and that's forced the Fed despite everything else going on. Post COVID challenges, the war in Europe, geopolitical issues with China, to really prioritize bringing prices down, which will commit the expense of economic growth. Headline CPI in September came in at 8.2% year over year. September was the third consecutive month that that headline number has ticked down off of the peak of 9.1% in June, but core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices, actually reaccelerated and hit a new high of 6.6% in September. This chart breaks down the contribution to headline CPI by category. Looking back to when inflation first started picking up, it was largely goods inflation that came on the back of a shift in spending patterns during COVID, folks at home buying stuff online, combined with supply chain issues. That has since corrected quite a bit. So it hit a high in February of this year, contributing two and a half points to headline CPI. And by September, that was down to 1.4 points and could continue to get better from here, given where retail inventories are and the discounting we're already seeing this far in advance of holiday. Food has been a growing contributor, and energy has been a big factor this year and a volatile factor. Energy hit a peak in June when it was contributing about one third to total inflation. That then eased through September as gasoline prices fell. That took out about 150 basis points from headline inflation over the last three months, though could tick back up from here given OPEC's plus oil production cut. And lastly, the services. Services make up about 60% of the CPI basket with rent and oil equivalent being about half of it, so 30 percent of the basket and both have been top contributors to inflation this year. CPI rent and owner's equivalent are both pretty lagged. So, so far, none of the more recent relief we've seen in rents and housing prices has been captured in CPI that will eventually flow through, which is a positive, but there is a floor to that given the secular undersupply of housing. The Fed fund slide. You're leaving me hanging here, Greg. There, aren't we? I think we are on the Fed fund slide. All right, I don't see it on mine, but I am going to keep talking. Uh, so we noted the Fed is focused on bringing down inflation, and to do so, they've been increasing the Fed funds rate throughout the year. It's already up 300 basis points year to date, oh, over the last five FOMC meetings. And based on Powell's most recent comments, the market is expecting another 75 basis point increase at the November, or yes, the November meeting, 50 basis points at the December meeting, and then 25 basis points at the first meeting in 2023. The Fed has indicated that they would ideally like to pause at that point 
wait for some of this lag data to catch up to fully understand the impact of what would at that point then be a four and a half to four and three quarters Fed funds rate and then go from there, maybe raise again if needed. That is not historically how it's ever worked. The Fed has to stay data dependent. The data is lagged and they have to make noticeable progress on inflation and labor before they can pause. And history has shown that it is much more likely that they will overshoot and that that first move after the pause is actually a cut because economic growth will have slowed enough to warrant it. Jessica, we're on the labor market slide. I'm not sure if everyone can see it, but I know at least some of them can. So if you want to just proceed with the presentation and uh, I will go along with the slides. All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so labor market is another key factor in all this. Another way to think of inflation is as the difference between wage growth and productivity. To get inflation down to the Fed's 2% target, assuming productivity of 1.5%, you need to bring wage growth down to 3.5% versus the 5.5% that it's been trending at. To do that, unfortunately, we have to increase unemployment. The Fed has made some progress cooling the labor market. Quit rates have slowed. The ratio of job openings to unemployed workers has decreased, but we continue to add jobs in the 200K range month to month, and the unemployment rate is still too low in terms of inflation at 3.5%. As financial conditions tighten, we should see companies first slow hiring, then potentially increase firings, which would help lower inflation, which is the primary goal. But this, of course, is not an exact science, and there's always the risk that it goes too far. Unemployment is something that tends to see the economy falls into recession. This brings us to GDP. I'm going to assume some folks can see that slide. Uh, we got the first estimate of Q3 GDP this morning, an annual increase of 2.6%. This follows the two negative quarters of GDP from the first half of the year. So both those negative quarters and what looked like a bounce back this quarter were due to more volatile components of GDP, like trade and government spending. Consumer spending is really the core of our economy and comprises 70% of GDP. Consumer spending was positive in the first half of the year and remained positive in Q3, but did slow. And that should really be the biggest takeaway from this morning's report. As headwinds continue to build for the consumer, as higher interest rates flow through, it will be tougher to avoid recession, especially if unemployment has to increase. Historically, every time the Fed has increased unemployment by 50 basis points or more, it has triggered a recession. And while there is always the this time could be different argument, it's hard to make that your base case. And that's what's driving markets right now. And the U.S. economy really is a bit of a mixed bag as we as we think through all the different dynamics you've spoken about here this morning or this afternoon, Jessica, with with inflation. There are further rate increases coming in. While certainly the GDP number, for, from an absolute perspective, was more good than bad this uh, this morning in this morning's report. There there's there's some other issues bubbling beneath the surface, which you touched upon. And and again, a lot of things to monitor as we move forward here. And as we transition over to 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 asset classes, we'll start with fixed income because it's it's a fairly natural progression in talking about the economy and Federal, Federal Reserve policy and interest rate movements to discuss fixed income such, such as a tangible and direct effect on the asset class. So James, it hasn't been a great year for fixed income this year. Talk a little bit about that and a little bit about what you're watching for for the rest of the year. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, definitely has not been a good year for fixed income. Fixed income returns are once again dismal in the third quarter because the U.S. aggregate posted returns of negative 4.8% in the last three months. Initially, the index started the quarter strong, posting its best month of returns in July and continued to rally into August on the hope of easing inflation and a possible Fed pivot on its hawkish policy. However, this rally dissipated swiftly as began as, as began as the Federal Reserve reiterated its commitment to fighting inflation, causing interest rates to move higher and turn fixed income performance back to negative. With year-to-date performance of negative 14.3% through the third quarter, the Bellwether Fixed Income Index is on pace for by far its worst year in existence. We're using the AG as a proxy for broader fixed income returns here, but this trend is reflected across fixed income asset classes and sectors. Looking at the U.S. Treasury yield curve, as the Fed continues to hike interest rates, the front end of the yield curve continues to move higher and quicker than back end rates, causing an inversion of the yield curve. Short-term interest rates are more sensitive to the path to Fed policy, and as the Fed moves its policy rate higher, short-term rates move more swiftly to price this in. When referring to an inversion of the yield curve, we're typically referring to the two and 10-year Treasury rates. So when looking at the yield between two and 10-year Treasury rates, these rates inverted for the first time since 2007 back in July and has remained inverted through quarter end. The spread in the two and 10 reached its steepest level inversion since 2000, and as a quarter end, since the two-year sits at 4.15%, while the 10-year sat at 
as quarter four has begun to play out, rates at the front end continue to move even higher. Let's take a look at fixed income spreads and yields. Fixed income spreads were fairly mixed during the quarter. Spread sectors rallied in July and for most of August, but September saw a reversal as the Fed maintained its hawkish policy stance. As of quarter end, most spread sectors finished around where they were from a spread level perspective and, the and still remained primarily above long-term averages. So there's still some value to be found. Now, taking a look at yields, these continue to march higher as rates across fixed income or continue to march higher as rates rise across fixed income to reflect hawkish Fed policy. Yield sectors, yields across sectors are now at levels we haven't seen in over a decade, going back to the great financial crisis. Yields on IG corporate credit are at their highest point since 2008. The last time the yield on the high yield index was near this level was after the energy sell off in 2016 and before that, the great financial crisis. The same is true for yield levels and leverage loans, and the same is true for EMD as well, as those are hitting long term highs. While it has been a tough year for fixed income, as my colleague Frank Valley stated before, fixed income has finally gotten its last name back income. There's been quite a lot of discussion amongst participants in the market and investors about the Federal Reserve and the size of its balance sheet. The Fed has begun quantitative tightening. And while it's not outright selling Treasury and agency assets, it is reducing the size of its balance sheet by capping reinvestments and allowing securities to mature. Many speculate about the impact this will have on interest rates. Ultimately, this round of QT, the impact of this round of QT on interest rates is unknown and will most likely be relatively minor. Using Fed projections, it projects that the impacts of QT will be equivalent to one to three interest rate hikes if borrowing rate is held constant. The impact on longer term rates, such as the 10 year Treasury, will roughly be around five basis points, so very minimal. Now let's take a look at below investment grade defaults. As rates continue to rise, costs for companies increase and margins come under pressure, defaults in the below investment grade market are expected to rise. Defaults in both the high yield bond and leverage loan markets have increased this year, albeit off a record low base in 2021. It should not come as a surprise that defaults have increased and will continue to increase for the weakest companies as it becomes more expensive to service debt, the economy slows down, and the credit cycle begins to turn over. JP Morgan projects that high yield defaults are expected to increase to 1.8% and leverage loan defaults are expected to increase to 1.9% by the end of 2022. This trend will continue into next year with defaults expected to reach 2.3% and 2.9% for high yield and loans respectively. While defaults really have nowhere to go but up, projected defaults are still expected to be below long-term averages and be much lower for what is typically seen in an economic downturn. Some of the weakest issuers may not be spared, but the fundamentals of companies in the below IG space coming into this weakened economic environment are in a much stronger place than is typical. Many companies were able to finance issuance at rock bottom levels in the aftermath of the pandemic and push out their maturities, which will keep defaults from spiking to abnormally elevated levels. And lastly, let's take a look at some risks and opportunities in fixed income. The opportunities present in fixed income remain very similar to what they were at the end of Q2. First off, spread valuations are compelling again. After long periods of tight spreads, recent underperformance has created a more attractive entry point. Spreads in many sectors now trade at long-term averages or wider. Overall, the fundamentals in credit markets remain strong. While credit metrics are slowing, they remain solid with investment grade and high yield companies in a good position to service their debt. And additionally, agency MBS are starting to get interesting. As the Fed starts to exit the mortgage market, spreads on agency mortgages have widened and higher rates should slow prepayments. And finally, inflation break evens are coming off their peaks, and tips can now be an option now that inflation expectations have waned slightly. Now, looking at risks, the story is the same as it was in opportunities. The risks pretty much remain the same as they were at the end of Q2 and going into Q3. And these risks are similar to what you're going to hear across the rest of the asset classes during this webinar. But one of the primary risk factors facing overall markets is slowing global growth, which continue to weigh on fixed income performance. The Fed is continuing to take aggressive steps to curb inflation and are falling as aggressive steps to curb inflation and growth is falling as a result. The concern is now whether the Fed does too much and pushes the economy into a recession. Expect heightened volatility of spread sectors during this period, which we've seen near this last quarter. And, and lastly, geopolitical risks remain a headwind for markets and seemingly have no clarity. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has not been resolved and it clouds the economic outlook for Europe. Relations with China continue to be fraught and could deteriorate further. 
and, and to sum up fixed income, and this is a, a narrative that will really be applicable to the equity market discussion as well, is that this year has really been one of pain as, as markets have repriced and there have been a lot of adjustments across different valuation, metri valuation metrics and, and really predictors of future performance. Fixed income, the most telling and most insightful is interest rates. Interest rates have gone up a lot. It's been difficult for fixed income in terms of returns for 2022. But as, as James referenced just a couple of minutes ago, fixed income finally has gotten its last name back, income. And that pretends to further opportunities and better opportunities on a go forward basis for fixed income. And then also we'll touch upon that as equities, but not wanting to spoil the message from our analysts, I will pass it over to Catherine now, let her talk a little bit about what we've seen so far, particularly in the third quarter, as well as what she's watching for for the rest of the year. So Catherine, over to you. Great, thank you, Greg. We'll start with a look at U.S. equity performance. With the exception of the Russell 2000 Growth Index, major domestic equity indices closed the third quarter with losses. The Russell 2000 Growth Index, which you can see in the bottom of the row, in the bottom row of the table, and is a measure of small cap growth performance, peaked out at two tenths of a percentage point gain for the quarter, while the S&P 500 fell almost five percent. In contrast, for the year through September, large cap equities have mostly fared better than their smaller counterparts. As James touched on, the third quarter was a tale of two halves, as a re relief rally in the first six weeks through mid-August saw all major domestic equity indices up double digits. Similar to the dynamics that impacted fixed income markets in this somewhat brief reprieve, volatility declined as hopes of the Fed slowing the pace of interest rate hikes and inflation expectations falling after a potential peak in June dominated rhetoric. This spurred the relief rally, but unfortunately was a bit premature as markets turned on hot inflation data and Fed hawkishness in August. September, which is historically a difficult month for equity indices, followed trend as markets fell amid interest rate hikes in an adamant Fed stance to fight inflation. With this backdrop, the VIX again climbed above its 20-year historical average in the back half of the quarter. Volatility, unfortunately, was really only the was really the only constant for the year. This was the worst month and year-to-date third quarter performance for two decades. In the next couple of slides, we'll take a closer look at some of what drove this performance. In the third quarter, factor and sector leadership both saw some changes. Here we take a look at individual sector performance. And as you can see, the energy sector leadership is, clear, is a clear standout and continues to be the only positive sector through the first nine months of the year meaningfully outpacing all other sectors. While this slide is representative of the S&P 500, this actually holds true across the market cap spectrum. In the third quarter, however, you can see that the consumer discretionary sector actually led the way among large cap equities. This was supported by companies like Tesla, which while volatile, posted positive returns during the period. Notably, you'll also note that the energy sector did post small gains. And although not depicted on this slide, within small cap equities, the healthcare sector led. Despite rising interest rates that are typically a headwind for longer duration growth equities, such as biotechnology stocks, this industry actually rallied in the third quarter, contributing to performance for the healthcare sector overall. This sector performance might suggest the market was leaning into some of the most beaten down industries when investors were hopeful that there might be a path to easier policy and a Fed pivot earlier in the quarter. Now, looking at factor performance, through the first two quarters of the year, value-oriented factors have led market. While these factors, as you can see, value, low volatility, and yield have meaningfully outperformed year-to-date, they underperformed in the third quarter. In contrast, the growth factor, now down over 6% in 2022, was additive to performance in the third quarter. Quality, which you would generally expect to outperform in a market environment such as this, continues to waver. In a similar trend to what was seen across sectors and factors, we see that the most expensive quintile of stocks, which tend to be the longer duration growth names that have come under pressure amid the rising interest rates, led in the third quarter, although performance was still negative. These stocks had been under pressure through the first six, six months of the year and continue to trail meaningfully through the first nine months, as you can see them down over 36%. Looking at U.S. equity valuations now, we see that multiples continue to come under pressure amid rising interest rates, bringing valuations back in line with or below historical averages on a price-to-earnings basis. 
From a market cap perspective, the S&P 500 is trading right about in line with its 20-year average with continued pressures from rising labor and input costs, while small cap stocks look particularly attractive, trading below their long-term averages. It is worth noting, though, that within the small cap indices, not all these stocks are the same, and the profitless small cap companies continue to trade at elevated multiples. Additionally, while a sell-off of longer duration assets has brought a reduction in multiples across the growth-oriented indices, value-focused indices appear particularly attractive as multiples have compressed to the low ends of their historical ranges. Despite a narrowing equity risk premium, the earnings yield of the S&P 500 did rise alongside the 10-year Treasury yield, suggesting that stocks continue to look somewhat attractive relative to bonds, at least for the time being. And now on to some opportunities and risks moving forward. Despite a painful third quarter and quite frankly year for domestic equity indices, there are some positives. Attractive valuations, as we've mentioned, relative to history, especially among value and small cap stocks, may signal the opportunity to capitalize on mispricings in the market. However, there are still notable risks, including a hawkish Fed that is focused on combating inflation and continued geopolitical angst across the globe, also as Jane mentioned in the uh, fixed income section. Earnings have also been a topic of discussion, with growth this year primarily concentrated in the energy sector. Certain industries are starting to see possible cracks as well. This has been seen in the semiconductor industry, where concerns have arisen about weakening demand, leading to a handful of companies lowering their sales targets and earnings targets. More recently this week, you have also seen pressure on large cap tech stocks um, that have released earnings. We are likely to see continued volatility through the end of the year, given the un certain macro environment, but the fourth quarter is historically one of the strongest. The fourth quarter this year also includes midterm elections, which occur next month, and performance has also been strong in the months following these elections. However, it's a very different climate coming into the fourth quarter and midterm elections this year, with heightened inflation and rising interest rates. Election quarters tend to be followed by some form of stimulus, which has historically helped support markets. But given the level of stimulus we have already seen, this may not be the case this time around. With all that said, the market is hopeful for any sign of a pivot in Fed policy and is likely to trade on any news that signals the timing of that possible change. Thanks, Catherine. That's a great overview of U.S. equities. And again, consistent with the theme of, of a difficult year in 2022 and is likely to continue through the end of the year. 2023 will we'll continue to bring some volatility, but there are some longer term opportunities that are emerging from this. Now, that's the U.S. side of things. Now we're going to go overseas, if you will, talk about non-U.S. equities. And the speaker for this section is a familiar name for anyone who's been listening to the series. Uh, Evan Frazier will cover this section, except he's covering non-U.S. now instead of U.S. So, Evan, over to you. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. And uh, unfortunately, there's there's some more bad news here across the pond, so try not to shoot the messenger. Um, the third quarter marked the third consecutive uh, negative quarter for international equity markets broadly. If you can see here, the MSCI Acqui XUS uh, index was down about 10% during the period, bringing the year-to-date return for that benchmark to about negative 27% uh, through the end of last month. And as you can see from this table, both large and small cap developed market stocks you know, held up better than emerging market uh, equities during the period. However, the impact of currency continues to be more detrimental to the returns of DM equities versus their EM counterparts. And we'll discuss currency uh, a little later uh, in greater detail in this presentation. So here we can see both the returns uh, of each sector for the MSCI Acqui XUS uh, index, as well as the weight of each sector in that index uh, as of the end of last month. And the story here is similar to that uh, of the domestic side. So longer duration growth year stocks in sectors like consumer discretionary, communication services, tech, uh, those continue, continue to see uh, pretty significant repricing. So the tech sector of the Acqui X uh, is down about 40% on a year-to-date basis and was down another 12% during th uh, 3Q. The financial space is actually the largest sector in this index at about 21%. Uh, and that space was down about 8% in the third quarter bringing its year-to-date return to about negative 20%. So let's take a look at factor performance on the non-U.S. side of things. What we're looking at here are the absolute returns for the various MSCI Acqui XUS uh, style indices. And you'll notice that here again, directionally, uh, these factor returns in the international equity market have been pretty similar to those uh, in the U.S. So growth, quality, momentum factors, you know, those have been kind of the primary laggards on a year-to-date basis, while value, yield, 
low volatility, kind of more defensive areas of the market have held up relatively well. Uh, during the third quarter, I, I would say that factor leadership on the non-U.S. side of things was, was more muted relative to previous periods that we've seen in recent time. Value did outperform growth, but there was less than a percentage point of performance differential between those two styles during the third quarter. And then the quality factor continues to struggle amid ongoing investor focus on the, the macroeconomic environment, as well as the re, uh, some repricing of higher valuation uh, stocks. Let's look at performance on a country by country basis. And as the subtitle here kind of says, there hasn't really been anywhere to hide from a country perspective this year. Things have been pretty painful uh, across the board. So let's start in Europe. I think it's safe to say that the Eurozone and, and the UK economies are now either in or, or pretty darn close to a recession. Germany, as you can see here, has been one of the main laggards uh, from a country perspective on a year to date basis. Stocks in that country are down nearly 40% since the start of 2022, and we're down about 15% in Q3 amid uh, declining business activity in that country, uh, country persistently high inflation, uh, as well as increased energy costs, which are a particular headwind uh, for German equity. So Germany was uh, highly dependent on Russian oil and gas going into this year. That's obviously created some major problems for that country uh, in recent time. If we go across the channel, uh, and look at UK stocks, those were down about 12% during uh, 3Q amid a, a really a sharp drop in manufacturing in that country, as well as some uh, highly publicized uh, fiscal policy missteps of the now uh, old government that required some uh, intervention uh, by their central bank. Uh, and then China, uh, that's kind of been on, on everyone's mind of late. You can see that here. Uh, China was actually the worst uh, returning country on this list in the third quarter. And we'll detail uh, reasons for that poor performance uh, on the uh, next slide. Yep. So uh, Chinese equities were down about 23% during the third quarter, bringing their year-to-date return to about negative 30, negative 31%. Um, and really, the, the Chinese economy has been facing some serious headwinds. It's slowed to about 2.5% growth uh, for the current year, uh, as opposed to last year's figure of around 8%. So we've got slowing growth. Uh, and the reason for that, I, I guess there, there are a couple of main ones. Number one, uh, that the, the Beijing government is continuing its sort of uh, very restrictive zero COVID policies. Uh, and the country is also battling a, a pretty significant property market collapse. And those factors have, like I said, caused pretty significant challenges for, for the economy in China. And even in recent days, you know, we've seen uh, some pretty sharp sell offs uh, within the Chinese uh, equity market after their party Congress, during which uh, Xi Jinping won a third term as, as party leader and kind of further consolidated his political power. And I think this has kind of led investors to believe that China may be challenged in the future due to uh, heightened geopolitical and economic tensions uh, with, with the West. So yeah, here's the currency slide that I alluded to earlier. We talked about kind of the Fed uh, rate hikes earlier in the presentation. Those have also been uh, highly publicized, and, and these have caused pretty significant waves in, in currency markets where the dollar obviously has risen to, to multi-decade highs against major international currencies in recent months. And, you know, when you've got U.S. interest rates rising rapidly and investors worried about potentially a global economic slowdown, I think a lot of investors have moved into uh, the U.S. dollar in search of uh, yield, as well as kind of its, its perceived status as a, as a safe haven. So the dollar rose about eight and a half percent during the third quarter, while currencies like the euro fell about six and a half percent against the dollar. The yen fell about 15 percent. And you know this this is a major headwind for for U.S. investors and in international equities because the the currency component, uh, currency movements rather, are a key component of the total return uh, for non-U.S. stocks. Again, for those investors based uh, here in the states. So, kind of uh, going along with what Catherine was talking about earlier, if there is a bright spot in all all of this uh, difficulty and, and pain, it uh, maybe has to do with kind of how valuations look. Uh, within the international equity market. So if you look at forward PE ratios for developed market indices, so the EFA and the EFA small cap indices, you know, those benchmarks sit within the cheapest quintile for their respective um, benchmarks, or I should say those multiples sit within uh, the cheapest quintile, their respective benchmarks uh, for the last couple of decades. And so things are also cheap within emerging markets on a forward PE basis. The MSCI EM index currently sits to within close of the, the cheapest third of its history and is even cheaper based on other metrics like price to book, price to sales, again, relative to the last couple of decades. So international stocks, uh, cheap relative to their own histories, uh, but they're also cheap relative to U.S. stocks, which is, you know, of course, seen their multiples come down over the last several months. So you can see here the S&P 500, which, of course, is a domestic equity benchmark, currently trades at about 15 times 
forward earnings, which is right around its, its long-term average, but that's compared to, you know, multiples of what, right around, you know, 10, 10 and 11 for, for non-U.S. Uh, indices. Uh, so again, non-U.S., cheap relative to its own history um, and cheap relative to domestic equity indices as well. So in terms of the go forward for international stocks, I, I think there are definitely more risks uh, facing just global equity markets in general than there are opportunities within the space, at least in the near term. Uh, for instance, I talked about, you know, Europe facing some difficulties. Inflation, I think, is yet to peak there. And what's more, um, central banks in Europe have been far less restrictive uh, than the Fed in terms of keeping those price levels down. And I also think that Europe in particular is in a precarious situation in terms of kind of balancing the fight against inflation with encouraging and stimulating economic growth. Growth has already been uh, slowing pretty significantly on that continent. And if central banks become too restrictive, that could choke off growth and uh, lead to, to more challenges along those lines. I talked a little bit uh, about geopolitical issues. Those aren't going away anytime soon. Obviously, we have the, the conflict in Eastern Europe and Ukraine. We know the impact that's having both at the humanitarian level as well as within capital markets. Talked about China. One thing I didn't mention on, on the China side is um, the new restrictions that were just announced by, by the U.S. in recent time that limit uh, semiconductor exports to China. This is yet another example of uh, increasing tensions between uh, China and the United States. That's to say nothing about uh, China's possible designs on uh, Taiwan. And then just the idea that the U.S. is kind of more of a safe haven for investors across asset classes. And so if volatility continues, we could see more interest in you know, domestic securities because of perceived safety relative to those in other parts of the world. You know, as far as opportunities go, I definitely think those are more kind of long term in nature, but, but are certainly worth mentioning. Uh, I talked earlier about valuations of many non-U.S. equity indices being more attractive relative to where they've been in the last couple of decades uh, and relative to kind of where domestic uh, equity benchmarks sit right now. Typically, obviously, stronger returns occur when you've got a valuation, uh, valuation entry point uh, that's more attractive. And then on the currency side, you know, the dollar is going to revert at some point. It might not happen in the near term. Again, if, if the Fed is going to be uh, continue to be aggressive on the inflation front, uh, especially if unemployment remains low, there's no reason to believe they, they won't. Uh, and of course, more restrictive monetary policy typically leads to the currency uh, becoming uh, more more valuable and, and appreciating. But certainly when the Fed stops its hiking cycle, perhaps sometime next year, uh, that should lead to the dollar becoming a little weaker relative to other currencies. And, and that could be uh, a tailwind for, for the returns of, of non-U.S. stocks for, for us uh, U.S. investors. And uh, on that positive note, I'll turn it back over to you, Greg. Thanks, Evan. And just to summarize the outlook for, for equities in general is, is that it, it's expected to be another couple of quarters of, of choppy performance, but the but the medium term performance potential, let's let's call it two to four years, is, is certainly more promising as kind of a fallout for, from the repricing we've seen in, in 2022. So that wraps the traditional asset class discussion of fixed income, U.S. equities and non-U.S. equities. And we'll transition now to the alternatives portion of today's webinar. We'll start with hedge funds. And, and Chad, hedge funds actually have a pretty good story to tell this year. Now, the, re the returns on absolute basis aren't off the charts positive. Hedge funds have certainly done what, what has been kind of promised. They protected, uh, they really protected from these market losses and help pr provide some protection. So uh, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the the comments and the introduction kind of stealing my thunder a little bit there. But uh, with the ongoing macro challenges and uncertainty investors have been facing so far this year, hedge funds have actually done their job overall, helping to prevent to protect investor capital for both the quarter and on a year to date basis. So just looking at, looking at Q3, the HFRI composite was down only slightly, down about 60 basis points, bringing year to date performance to about negative 6%. With broad fixed income and U.S. equities each down nearly 5% for the quarter, hedge funds have done a reasonably good job, again, navigating, navigating this highly volatile period. Now, looking at some of the various sub-strategy types within hedge funds, macro-oriented and trend-following strategies have clearly posted strong gains in the quarter, as they have all year long, reflecting the robust opportunity set created by this macro-level volatility. The HFRI macro index posted a strong positive 2.2% return in Q3 and has posted a gain of nearly 11% so far this year. If you look at what's really driving those returns for macro funds, it's really been two things. Positioning within commodities and energy has certainly driven gains. I would say most of that has occurred in the first half of the year, but the bigger driver has really been this story of the US dollar strength relative to, to really all other currencies. Managers have continued to position themselves for further dollar strengthening relative to you know, every other currency. 
And as Evan noted, at some point that will change. This dollar strengthening story will shift and revert. But for now, managers are still positioned for further strengthening as a key driver of returns so far this year and potentially into to early next year. If you look outside of macro funds, the other major sub strategies have also held up well in the quarter, with most strategies either posting positive gains or only slight losses. That said, one area that has been more difficult and challenged this year is equity long short funds, posting a negative 2.3% decline for the quarter and down about 14% on a year to date basis. Still, if you compare that performance to broader equity markets, the equity hedge funds have still outperformed, reflecting a cautious and conservative posturing, which has ultimately benefited on a relative basis. To highlight this, we can look at hedge fund leverage for equity hedge funds on the next slide here. As you can see on the chart, gross and net leverage have declined steadily in 2022, showing this increasing cautious position for managers. As of September, net leverage reached 35%, and that's basically the lowest level we've seen dating back to 2009. We saw it touch that period, uh, that low level around June or so this year uh, before picking up and then ultimately retesting those lows. In, in addition to this conservative posturing, just from a leverage standpoint, we've also seen managers shift their exposures within their portfolios, moving into more defensive sectors, lower beta names, and many managers have also increased their usage of index level hedges to further increase downside protection, given the uncertainty in this environment. In essence, hedge fund managers are really positioned with caution today, really for, for two purposes, to, to help protect on the downside, but to also be in a strength of a position of strength to add exposure when there's better clarity from a macro standpoint uh, and, and really when fundamentals start to, to really drive the picture going forward as we head into 2023. Now, if we stick with equity long short funds and turn to performance on both the long and short side, there's no doubt that the pressure has really come from long exposures within hedge funds uh, so far this year. The main reason for that really comes down to a sector exposure story, namely technology stocks. So while it's true that equity hedge funds have the lowest exposure they've had to tech over the last 12 months or so, tech remains still the single largest sector in those portfolios, and that accounts for somewhere around a third of that positioning uh, on an aggregate basis. Now, if you look at the short side, short positioning has really generated strong alpha throughout the year. No surprise, broader equity markets down, being short, especially the crowded names in the hedge fund portfolio has really been a positive. Uh, but for the most recent quarter, those shorts have actually been a modest detractor as crowded shorts have actually outperformed both crowded longs and the broader index as a whole. So on an absolute basis, the short portfolios within these hedge funds have generated positive returns for, for those managers all year long. Now, shifting just a little bit and, and really trying to drive home the point of, of the benefit of hedge funds in a portfolio as an important diversifier, we can contextualize 2022's performance relative to other drawdown periods in history. So as you can see on this chart, hedge funds have broadly provided downside protection relative to both international equities, global equities, U.S. equities, however you want to look at it, in every drawdown period we've seen over time. This has been particularly true here in 2022, with the HFRI composite capturing only a fraction of the downside we've seen in equities this year, something like 25 26% or so. Broadly speaking, you can see hedge funds have protected in every one of these periods over history, which is, again, a, a reiteration for the value of hedge funds as an important building block in the asset allocation process for investor portfolios. So really, just to, to bring this all together to sum it all up, hedge funds have really done their job. They've, they've served their purpose in client portfolios, broadly speaking. Uh, they've blunted the downside, protected against particular equity and fixed income declines so far this year. So while it's been a difficult environment, uh, hedge funds are, again, they're, they're serving their purpose. They're doing their what they're supposed to do, which is becoming more conservative when things are uncertain. And again, be in a position to take advantage of better opportunities as we head into 2023. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Greg. Thanks, Chad. And, and really, I, I think that's the big takeaway is that hedge funds have met expectations. Expectations are in times of market stress. Hedge funds will help protect principal and not participate fully in the downstream we've seen in the market. So hedge funds have, have certainly achieved their goals for the year. Now, in terms of meeting expectations, I think one of the expectations that real assets for both real estate and infrastructure is in times of inflation, when interest rates are going up, when inflation levels are going up, real estate and infrastructure should help protect from some of the detrimental effects 
of such an environment. Josh, real estate has really checked that box as well. So maybe talk a little bit about what you've seen out of real estate and then also the outlook for infrastructure. Awesome. Thanks, Greg. So starting off with performance here, based on lag second quarter returns, commercial real estate performance has started to moderate from rolling one year highs. Valuations at the property level have started to equilibrate as a result of increasing in cap rates and financing costs eroding income generated even with the in favor sectors. The ongoing property fundamentals and pricing activity in the past quarter po points to the strength of the industrial and multifamily sectors. However, with structural factors weighing down on certain sectors and markets combined with the uncertainty of higher interest rates and slower economic growth, returns are expected to moderate from this level for the balance of year. Looking at the returns at the sector level, as inflationary trends continue to drive an increase in replacement costs related to construction, labor, and land, investors will look to target shorter duration lease structures in multifamily and hospitality as a means to reset rents to market level and pass incremental costs to existing and new tenants. As a result of this backdrop, incremental income growth in excess of maintenance, capex, and financing costs is expected to morph as a major component of absolute returns in the coming years, thereby offsetting the diminishing returns from cap rate compression. Focusing on the impact interest rates and hikes have had on real estate, we recognize the inflationary pressure that the Fed has taken in raising the Fed funds rate and tapering its balance sheet. Historically, core real estate has performed well during periods of higher interest rates. A rising Fed funds rates usually suggests faster economic growth and higher demand for real estate. Investment in commercial real estate is expected to continue at a steady pace, although the market has begun to slowly adjust expectations under the new rate environment. Typically, strong tenant demand for real estate leads to higher NOI growth across portfolios, at least partially offsetting the potential negative impact from cap rates and debt costs. Taking a look at the incremental cash flows generated at the property level, Despite favorable demographic employment and wage growth factors, rent growth patterns by property sector have started to exhibit apparent patterns of dispersion and inconsistency. Even with the luxury of shorter duration lease structure, multifamily market to market rate, rate increases have started to normalize. The industrial sector, bound by longer term leases and limited CPI escalators, has seen a leveling off of NOI trajectories in the short term. Furthermore, as a slowing economy and e commerce penetration may continue to weigh in on in store consumer spending this year, this trend will likely translate into choppier growth across retail segments. Finally, and on top of most investor minds, the office market has seen a slight increase in rents, but moderation in rent growth is expected given an elevated levels of unit availability. Moving on to infrastructure. Infrastructure performance started to regress in the first quarter, declining by 4% within the broad private market index. Investors find themselves in a complex and challenging environment. Market volatility and interest rate risk are currently impacting both public and private markets as a result of central bank policies, rising commodity prices, supply chain disruptions, and geopolitical conflicts. Moving on to the pivot towards the clean energy transition. Prospective opportunities are expected in clean energy and the energy transition in the coming decades. Potentially, Attractive yield opportunities include distributed solar, onshore wind, and battery storage systems. Accelerating energy innovation is proving to be a key driver of decarbonizing the economy and mitigating climate change and also expanding the opportunity set for infrastructure-focused investors. The recently passed Inflation Reduction Act aims to help offset long-term inflationary pressure via targeted spending in clean energy renewables 
and decarbonization initiatives over the next decade plus. Comparing the yield benefits to the public equity universe. Core infrastructure has provided steady, reliable, and attractive yields relative to public equity proxies. The contracted revenues of utility companies, which often have periodic escalators linked to inflation, are well positioned to offer inflation from market fluctuations. Regardless of the market volatility that may impact stock price and capital appreciation, Listed infrastructure cash flow in the form of EBITDA and dividend yield has remained resilient across market cycles. Over the past 12 years, the dividend yield has consistently been higher than the broad market equity index on a historical basis. And that's really the compelling reason to invest in both infrastructure and core real estate. It's a yield play. It's an income play more than a price appreciation play. And that's been distorted a little bit over the last decade or so of what you've seen happen with real estate prices. But at the end of the day, historically, the great majority of returns comes from the income piece or the yield piece of this and will continue to be the piece, continue to really be the driving force of returns on a go forward basis for both core real estate and infrastructure. So with the real assets section wrapped up now, we have private markets to cover both private equity and private credit. And before handing it off to Brett, just a reminder to all listeners that if you have a question, please do use the Q&A feature on your screen to submit it. We will cover as many as we can. Those that we don't have time to cover during the, the hour this afternoon, we will follow up directly with you. So all that said, Brett, we got private equity and private credit to navigate here. They're both yours. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it. And starting taking a look at, at private equity performance and remembering that private equity performance reports on a lag basis, but looking at global and North American private equity performance, in particular in the second quarter 2022, the marketplace was down approximately four and a half percent. While it was down, it still substantially outperformed majority of public market indices. Overall time periods, which includes the one, three, five, and 10 year period, global private equity and North American private equity has, out, has consistently outperformed public equity indices, which includes the MSCI Acqui, the S&P 500, the Russell 3000, and the Russell 2000 Growth Index. 2021 was a record year from private equity deployment standards, which was supported by a challenging year in 2020 caused by the COVID pandemic, record low interest rates, which actually saw a glut of managers look to sell portfolio companies and take advantage of increasing purchase price multiples and cheap debt. Similarly, investor demand for private equity has continued to grow, evident by the nearly record amounts of dry powder sitting on the sidelines waiting to be invested by private equity sponsors. This capital will continue to be a tailwind for the overall market activity, which is sponsors search for high quality portfolio companies that are resilient in the light of inflation and rising interest rates. Taking a look at downturns, and while we understand that every recession and every crisis is different, we recognize that there are investment lessons to be learned from those challenging market environments. And looking back in particular at the dot-com crisis and the global financial crisis, Private equity did not suffer as steep a pullback relative to the public equity markets and produced significant outperformance in the subsequent years. While it's impossible to predict the same outperformance going forward, it's fair to acknowledge that, the co that coming out of a significant market pullback tends to produce the strongest private equity vintage returns for investors. I'm looking at, at venture, venture capital deployment activity broke records in, in 2021 almost doubling the previous record high the year before in 2020. Much of this activity was driven by strong returns in the public market and the accommodative IPO market. Furthermore, or alternatively, 2022 has been substantially more muted as the public market has sold off significantly through the first half of the year, and the IPO markets are meaningfully less attractive than what they were a year ago. We expect this trend to continue through the end of the year as early and late stage valuations retrench in this rising rate environment. Shifting to, to private credit, and once again, reporting on a lag basis, private credit finished down nearly 1.5% for the second quarter 2022, but exceeding all public fixed income and equity indices. Similarly, over the one, three, five, and 10 year periods, private credit has bested all public fixed income and equity indices, except for the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500 during those four time periods. Overall, the return and yield premium achieved by investing in private credit remains as a return driver and a risk mitigant for the asset class, garnering much demand. And looking at periods of, of monetary tightening, 
In 2021 and now in 2022, inflation has emerged as a top threat to investor portfolios and a threat to the marketplace. Private credit provides a viable option to help investors mitigate their risks within their portfolios. Private credit offers protections against inflation. Private credit returns are generated from the interest that is based on a floating rate. That floating rate nature, that floating rate component of loans means that if inflation causes short-term interest rates to rise, investors can be protected or hedged. Floating rate loans are highly likely to outperform fixed rate bond allocations in a rising rate environment, similar to what we're experiencing today. Finally, looking at downside protection, private credit continues to prove itself to be a worthy consideration to client portfolios as a complement to an existing fixed income portfolio or to a dedicated alternative sleeve that contains other asset classes, such as private equity and venture capital. At origination, private credit continues to yield a couple hundred basis points more than high yield bonds and senior loans while providing a lower loss profile. Additionally, private credit acts, acts to mitigate the J curve when added to a broader alternatives portfolio like private, like private equity and like venture capital. All these merits have propelled private credit to be now the third largest private market asset class in the space today. With that, I'll pass it on to Greg to, to finish it up. Thanks, Brad. And, and really, just to sum up private equity and private credit, the expectation, despite everything we've seen across the economy and markets this year, the expectation is that private equity and private credit will can you continue to be long-term accretive additions to portfolios and really help boost portfolio returns. That's the end of our prepared remarks, and we're, we're, we're onto the Q&A sec section right now, and we're going to do things a little bit differently. What we did this year, because it's been such a volatile quarter, we took the liberty of talking to some of our consultants who have been out to a lot of meetings already and asked them what they're hearing most commonly. And then what we did is aggregated all those results across consultants, organized them into a series of questions that we want to start this off with. The extent that we get through all these and there's time afterwards, we'll certainly um, spend the rest of the time answering any questions that come in externally. But because we're getting this from multiple clients, the multiple client times, so we thought it was valuable to work through these first. Now, these are organized kind of in the order that we covered the asset classes. So, James, first one's going to go to you. And the question, quite simply, is why are defaults expected to increase by more, uh, increase more by in leveraged loans than they are relative to high yield? I know you, we had a newsletter about this a couple of weeks ago that you had mm -hmm. written, but maybe share some of the big takeaways or, or, or guidance that that you shared in that newsletter. Yeah, so there are many reasons for this, and I could kind of go on about it all day. I think it's a great question, but the main thing is a loan market right now is a lower quality market than the high yield market. There's a larger percentage of single B securities in that in that market in the loan market than there's in high yield, which means they're riskier companies with higher credit risk. And as rates go up, it's gonna be harder for them to service their debt. Now, also, there's higher leverage present in new loan issues um, than there is in the high yield market. So, you know, as companies with higher cash burn rates. Uh, that tend to issue in the loan market, they'll come under pressure as interest rates reset at higher levels. Pather, next one, next one is for you. And, and one of the one of the kind of guidance pieces or we, we shared with clients so far is that that growth stocks ha have generally underperformed more or let's just say performed worse as rates have gone up, partly because of the present value calculation we talked about a little bit. And we don't need to get into that now, but maybe just get into the question itself of in lieu of rising rates. Why did the growth factor actually outperform in the third quarter and why did quality struggle? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think one that has perplexed many um, because quality has struggled throughout the year, which, as we mentioned earlier, is fairly atypical in this market environment. So starting with that, quality can be thought of as items like strong balance sheets or cash flows and company characteristics that usually help provide a level of defensiveness in down markets. So as we discussed, value factors have driven performance this year and quality and value factors in more recent years have actually been negatively correlated. So as you have seen value outperform and seen that strength in that factor, you've subsequently seen quality underperform. Um, so another factor also affecting this is these higher quality uh, companies tend to be relatively more expensive. Um, and we've also seen the more expensive quintiles underperform, while the cheapest quintiles, which tend to be more typical of value, um, have outperformed. So in contrast, the growth factor um, was supported earlier in the quarter, as we discussed, by the hope for a more dovish stance from the Fed, which did not play out. Um, so however, the back half of the quarter did see a shift in focus to more defensiveness. And given the continued macro uncertainty and hawkish Fed, um, focusing on companies exhi exhibiting these quality characteristics, such as strong balance sheets, may be more supportive in the near term. Thank you. Evan, you spent some time and dedicated a, a slide to about why why China equities have, have really had a 
tough go of it this year, but another very large emerging market economy is Brazil, and those equities have done really well. What are the reasons why Brazilian equities have, have done so well this year? Yeah, so uh, Brazil has been an interesting story. Uh, stocks in that country are up about 10% uh, for the year when, you know, like we saw earlier, pretty much everyone else is down, you know, double digits. Um, the fact is their economy has been strong. So going into the year, a lot of economists thought that they would grow sort of flat for the, uh, for the year. Um, consensus is now about 3% for 2022. Unemployment has fallen back down into, into the single digits. Inflation in that country has dropped pretty precipitously. Uh, it's projected to be around 5 to 6% uh, at the end of the year, uh, off a peak of about 12 uh, just a couple months ago. Their central bank has been very aggressive on that front. Their currency has been strong uh, as a result. And uh, Brazil is also benefiting from strong uh, prices of its export commodities, so oil, uh, grain, iron ore, those types of things, um, the materials and energy spaces, um, which are obviously sensitive to the prices of those commodities, make up about a little less than half uh, of the Brazilian equity market. So time will tell about its kind of prospects going forward. There are definitely some risks uh, that, are, that are posed to that country right now. Its economy faces the risk of kind of a global economic slowdown that could weaken its exports. They export a lot to China in particular, and we've talked about some of the issues there. Um, and, you know, they've got elect, uh, an election coming up, um, you know, in, in a couple of days, a runoff election um, for the presidency that could shake things up a bit, but um, certainly, certainly a bright spot uh, so far this year. All right. And Chad, next one's for you. This we talked about a little bit internally, but I don't think we spent much time talking about it on these webinars. And, and given the challenging macro environment and significant increase in interest rates in 2022, what does this mean for distressed credit managers and their opportunity set? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question, and I didn't really spend too much time talking about credit managers and, and how they're thinking about the environment. But if you just think of you know, some of the things we talked about in some of the other sections, uh, fixed income, for example, rising rates, rising yields, widening spreads, uh, the ever-increasing risk of a recession, a number of other pressures, it's clearly the opportunity set for distressed and stressed credit players. Uh, it's clear that that opportunity set's improving. However, I, in talking with a number of managers, I, I think the the general tone we've heard is that it's one of caution. Um, in the near term, managers are, are certainly being more opportunistic, taking advantage and, and carefully picking their spots. Um, but I think the expectation is that, that we're entering what, what appears to be and is likely a, a longer distress cycle. Um, so there's definitely being a premium placed on being more conservative, in some cases holding some dry powder, just being in a position to really take advantage when when the opportunity set is really there. So so there's certainly more to do right now. Uh, managers are certainly uh, uh, speaking to the attractiveness of specific areas within credit. Um, but until we see a significant pickup in defaults, I think managers are generally just picking their spots carefully where they're adding exposure. Um, so you know, generally, again, it's back to, to more of a story of being conservative, being in a position to, to play offense when the opportunity set is really robust and attractive. Um, so I think we're getting there. We're just not necessarily there quite yet. All right, and we're coming up on the top of the hour. I do want to be mindful of listeners' time. So we're going to go rapid fire here. Josh, I'm going to cut this down to one on the real asset side of things. I want to hit real estate because that's probably the, the, the more common holding across all of our clients. You've been to a lot of conferences. There's a bit of a divergent story across sectors and core real estate. But uh, you know, if you had to pick one theme that's really at the top of investors' minds as it, as, it, as it relates to commercial real estate, what is it? Yeah, good question, Greg. So Asset pricing entry and exit points are starting to incorporate the more hawkish tone by the Fed as il illustrated by the increased cost of financing, cost of debt, um, and the gapping out of cap rates by 50 to 100 basis points on average since last year. Broader questions remain about a pending 2023 recession and capital market volatility, which are starting to negatively impact underwriting and realizations all across the board but also starting to amplify the portfolio denominator effect and increase redemption cues for institutional investors. Well, a lot to unpack there, but certainly the sources of uncertainty, but also some positive momentum behind what real estate's done year to date. All right, Brett, you get last at bat here this afternoon with the syndicated loan leverage market kind of closed for business. How is this really impacting private credit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll be quick. And you know, the, the short of it is, it's 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 created a immense opportunity to be the lender of choice for private market lenders as the leveraged loan market has been closed. The target-rich environment where now they can lend to to the best businesses 
they have no competition in the marketplace. You know, with the volatility they're seeing, spreads increase by a couple hundred basis points. Um, they're seeing advantages when it comes to covenants and, and terms and, and so forth. So I think it's you know probably one of the the best environments as far as opportunity set and quality of company set goes for private market lenders um, in the past five to ten years. Excellent, thank you. Well, everyone, it is, is top of the hour. It, it, it is two o'clock here in Chicago, three o'clock out east. We really want to thank you for spending the last hour with us. We apologize for any technical difficulties that at the beginning of the call, we did get those all ironed out. If there are any questions about what was covered during any portion of this, please feel free to reach out to any of us. The, the most the easiest way to do that is to use the email address in front of you, research5 at marquetteassociates.com. Again, we hope this has been helpful. Please reach out with any further questions and have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.